Michael Eve here for Westmonster with Nigel Farage. How are you doing, Nigel? Fine, but bemused, you know, because this was the big Prime Minister's speech yesterday. Do you know, I've spoken at over 20 UKIP conferences, uh, five of them as party chairman, ten of them as party leader. I remember the first ever UKIP conference during the national anthem, the sign fell off the stage <laughs> onto the floor. But you know what? We were a month old. Um, I've also spoken. I remember the manifesto launch in 2015. I was ill. You know, and heck, it was a hell of a struggle. So all those problems and difficulties that can happen at conferences I've seen, but for the whole lot to happen on one day, uh, suggests to me that the whole thing's a shambles. What was even worse, though, than the conference and the content of the speech, which we'll come on to, was when I saw the Cabinet standing up to applaud, I just thought, is this the best our country's got? It really is pathetic, and I think unless something very rapid, very radical happens, we're headed for hardline socialism. So yeah, I mean, you've tweeted that, you know, if Theresa May stays in place as Prime Minister, you think there'll be a Corbyn government. Do you think that's now inevitable if she does stay in that role as Prime Minister? Well, all Corbyn needs to do is just sort of eat his vegan food and uh, generally tour around the country and not do too much. She's doing it for him. She's doing it for him. And then in terms of content, I mean, the very thought that it's a Conservative government that will now own our bodies when we're dead. I mean, of course there's a very good argument for organ transplant, um, very good argument indeed, and I would encourage people to opt in to it. And we can do that through education, we can do it through our GP surgeries. But the thought that the state owns your body and can do with it as it wishes afterwards is a fundamentally unconservative a uh, wholly illiberal principle. That was one of her big takeouts. And then to talk about a housing revolution, they're going to build 5,000 houses a year, and that's a revolution. And then to, to, to cap it all, literally, price controls on energy. I mean, why not set the price of bread? Why not just call yourself the Communist Party? I mean, the whole thing's unbelievable. There, is no, the, the, there was nothing for Brexiteers in that speech at all. There was no vision, there was no clarity. I'm sorry she had a cough. I'm not, I'm not going to criticise her for that. As I say, I've been there. I know what it's like to feel ill and be in front of an audience. But, but the, there is a total lack of professionalisation in the party. I mean, security. Can you imagine at a UKIP conference? I mean, nobody would have got within 10 yards of me before they were rugby tackled to the ground at best. You know, I mean, the whole thing's a shambles. What do you make of, you mentioned housing, what do you make of the fact there seems to be a complete lack of talking about borders now and controlling migration? That aspect of the, you know, the housing oh. issue has just been completely abandoned. What do well, you make of this? Well, of course, as I remember from the alternative leaders debate in 2015, when I was there with Sturgeon and whatever that green woman's name was, Natalie something, can't remember, um, doesn't matter. Um, but I mean, it was interesting, uh, Miliband was there too. And I said to those leaders of the other parties, Clegg and Cameron weren't there, I said, do any of you here think there's a link between net migration and housing. Oh no, we're just not building enough houses. The last time I looked, we have to build a new house every three and a half minutes in this country, a new dwelling every three and a half minutes, just to cope with current levels of migration. So they've tried, I think, to ignore the issue. Labour have done the same. Uh, they think they can get away with it because there is a current lack of potency in UKIP. I mean, that remains to be seen what will happen with their new leader. Um, and we're all going to put up with open borders continuing for the next five years. Well, I think at some point they might be in for a real surprise. You've mentioned a few times now, um, Conservative MPs in, in private perhaps not saying the same thing. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. What, what, what are you hearing? Well, it's really interesting. So I was up, at Ma up in Manchester on Sunday and with a microphone for LBC. So you interview people and you say, isn't Theresa May hopeless? No, she's really great, okay. Um, don't you need a new leader? Oh no, we're really happy with the leader we've got. Uh, isn't it time for a contest of some kind to try and work out some real direction for Brexit and the Conservative Party? No, 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 the last thing the party needs is a contest. And then you turn the microphone off and they take the clip off, they say, oh, she's hopeless, she's gotta go. I mean, this is happening right through the party. Absolutely, everyone I speak to in private thinks she's a disaster, uh, and yet, no one's got the guts in public to say it. I also want to know, that hall was at least 75% leave. Where are they? Where are the protests over transition periods, over open door immigration carrying on for five years, over the lack of ability to sign trade deals with the rest of the world? Do you know, back in 1992-3, I, I put my faith 
in the Conservative Party, in the rebels, the backbenchers, I believe they would crush Maastricht, or at very least, get us a referendum on the issue. And in the end, they put their loyalty to the leader and the party above their own conscience and above the interests of the country. And I think we're beginning to see the same thing happening again. What do you make of this uh, so-called implementation period, transition period? Do you think there's a real danger that the can being ca kicked down the road in such a way could actually put the whole Brexit process in peril? Could we see by the next election Labour going for, you know, completely staying in the customs union single market? Well, I think Labour have almost gone there already. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest disappointments of the lot is we know that Corbyn on this and on, uni and on unilateral nuclear disarmament, and so you're seeing through Starmer and others, uh, you know, a Labour position uh, that looks like the, you know, the single market customs union um, is, is their long-term goal. And on the current course, they're going to win the next election. If there was a, a push to oust Theresa May, is there an obvious candidate in your mind that you would like to see replace her in, in terms of guaranteeing that Brexit? Well, the one thing, being a bit older than you lot that, that in West Monster, that I've learned, is that history tells you the front runner never wins. Never, ever wins. Heseltine was the front runner uh, with his friend Geoffrey Howe sort of putting the boot in. But Heseltine, it was obvious that Heseltine would become the next leader. He didn't. The front runner never wins. So on that basis, it won't be Boris. So who will it be? Well, I wonder. You know, a couple of years back, we were told Jeremy Corbyn may not get enough signatures of MPs to even be on the ballot paper. And the suggestion was that one or two backbenchers signed the papers without really believing in him, just, just, just thinking there ought to be a proper contest that went on. Uh, and then once he was on the ballot paper, we were told, well, look, he's a backbencher. He's been 30 years on the backbenches, never been a party spokesman, no experience, uh, never held a senior role in, in any Commons committee. Um, it, quite unthinkable that somebody could come from the backbenches and, and storm the Labour Party leadership. And you know what he did? Um, there's, this, there's a chap from Somerset, you might have heard of him, Jacob something. Um, <laughs> Rhys Mogg's in almost exactly the same position because he's never been a spokesman for the party, not held senior position in politics. And I just, I'm beginning to wonder whether perhaps this party, that cabinet that we saw yesterday, looks so tired, so devoid of ideas, is so obviously going to lose to me the next election if they continue as they are, that maybe, just maybe, the radical option is the one they'll go for. So I, do you know what? A couple of weeks ago, I thought that I thought the Mogmentum thing was a bit of fun. Great fun. And I like Jacob, he's great. But I didn't think it was seriously gonna go anywhere. I'm beginning to change my mind. <clears throat> well, Westmonster was in Manchester and we saw huge crowds everywhere he went pretty much. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, there certainly seems to be a sense of, mm. of momentum behind him. Mm. Just changing topic slightly here, and obviously you're one of Britain's uh, most uh, experienced MEPs. You've been out in the European Parliament a long time now. We saw this week, I think, something that's been a bit underreported, which is this MEP vote against sufficient progress being made. Yeah. And of course, the reason it's significant is because the European Parliament, in the end, will get a vote on a final deal. We find out today, we've reported on Westminster, that actually two, included two Conservative MEPs oh, yes. voted against it this. Would have, would it would have been a lot more Tories had they not been up at uh, Manchester. Uh, look, the European Parliament resolution uh, goes a lot further than anything Barnier has talked about, anything. Uh, the Hofstadt even has uh, uh, publicly talked about. I'll do that again. Uh, the European Parliament resolution goes way beyond anything that Mr. Barnier has talked about, Mr. Juncker has talked about, and even in public, Mr. Verhofstadt has talked about. I mean, it even includes uh, full rights under the ECJ for children born in this country to European parents who, you know, in the years to come, it's impossible. And yet the Parliament passed it by 557 votes to 92, including, yes, a couple of British Conservatives, would have been a lot more Conservatives had they not been um, up in Manchester. So you do begin to say to yourself, well, even if a sensible deal gets thrashed out, maybe, just maybe, we're at a situation where whatever deal we do, the European Parliament's gonna veto it anyway. So maybe it's better just for the government to say, right, here's a deadline, this is what we want. If we don't get it, we're just out. We could just we, we we could literally be wasting our time. Yeah. Do you think? I mean, do you think the chances of that passing the European Parliament are quite slim now, having seen that vote? 
a final deal. Doesn't look pretty. No. Um, just changing topic slightly, Henry Bolton, a new UK leader, yep. um, crowned in, at the conference. Uh, I think you, you know. He wasn't crowned, he was elected. Yeah, yeah, elected. And that's a very important point to make. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, um, I've known Henry Bolton for a few years. A very, very sound, solid, decent guy. Um, more experience than the other party leaders added up together and multiplied by 10. He's done things in life, he's run things in life. He's got a heck of a difficult job, but let me be clear, I like him, I'm for him, and I want to help him if I can. Great. And finally, Catalonia. Obviously, I've, you've been speaking about it quite a yeah. bit on your show. Mm. Huge ramifications potentially in terms of the EU. Brussels saying that they'll have to leave. Uh, the independence referendum, the ugly scenes, the lack of response that we saw mm. of the EU from this, this brutality on the streets. I mean, mm. what do you make of it all? I think that the Spanish government have grossly misjudged uh, Catalonia in terms of the way they've behaved. I think the independence movement in Catalonia now has big momentum. And fascinatingly, here's an independence movement that might say, not just two fingers up to Madrid, but to Brussels also. Uh, I think it's very, very worrying. I thought the words of Timmermans yesterday, when he said that necessary force had been used, well, you could have said that about the Hungarian rebellion of 56 or the Prague Spring in 68. They do begin to resemble, to me, the old Soviet, as Trump would say, bad people. Nigel Farage, thank you very much. Thank you.